now that we have SnakeMake installed, and we have PyDot and Graphiz installed as well, we can open up VS Code, or whatever editor you choose, and we can actually start making our snake file. So I have VS Code open here. It is connected to my WSL, which is very likely not the configuration that you have. But in any case, you can open up the integrated terminal by doing Control Shift P and say view toggle integrated terminal. And it shows up on the bottom here. I like to put mine to the right, so I'm just going to keep it there for the remainder of the video. If you prefer yours at the bottom or the left, you are absolutely more than welcome to do that as well. And the first thing that we have to do is to once again inside VS Code, activate the conda environment. And now we're in the SnakeMake environment. For convenience, what we should be doing is adding our project folder to the explorer. So I'm going to make a folder here, mkdir, uh, for this tutorial, and I'm going to call it toots, short for tutorial. And now if we ls, we can see the folders that we have and the files that we have in the home directory. And here on this left panel, I can say add folder. And I'm going to add toots. And you will see now that on the left side, we have this directory. And the first thing we can do is click the new file thing and name a new file snake file with a capital S. And this is going to be the snake file that governs our workflow. All snake files typically start with what's called a rule all. And all is a reserved name for a rule that indicates that it is the final target of your workflow. So rules take on this syntactic format, rule, space, a one word name and a colon. And then all of the keywords that you would like to use for it, you would put in a tab indent underneath it. And typically these include input, colon, something, output, colon. You can have things like message, colon. And for the parameters of these keywords, you can put things typically in double quoted strings. So input could be some sort of file. Output could also be some sort of file. Message, once again, will be some text. And there are a few different ways of doing this. For example, we can also do it like this. And this would be a perfectly valid way of specifying inputs. If we had multiple inputs or outputs, we can put a comma after one and still keeping the tab indent to maintain a hierarchy in a file2.txt. If we had a third one, do file3.txt, and so on. And that applies for output as well. We could have copied the format there. We can also use triple quoted blocks, and these become very useful for us when we're doing the shell keyword. So for that, we say shell colon new line and we tab in and now we're doing triple quotes and in here we could put in a whole series of shell commands as if we were doing a mini terminal session so we can make make to your command and say test below that let's say we want to create a file in that new folder touch test dot some file dot txt and then we can remove test some file.txt. And the way that SnakeMake will interpret this is that it's as though you put in these three commands in that order and it will run them. So it will first make the directory, make the file, and then remove the file. Another way of doing shell for shorter commands is to do it as a single line, just like we have for input, output, and message. So if we wanted to just say, create a file, we could do that, and it would be perfectly valid. Of course, this becomes less useful as you have more and more shell commands that you want to do within a rule, and so that is important to know and keep in mind when you're establishing these rules. This would also be a great time to mention the extensions that I'm using inside VS Code, and for the purposes of this tutorial, all that you're really seeing is that I'm using the SnakeMake language add-on which just adds syntax highlighting to make things a little bit more visually easier. And I'm also using this indenticator, which is what's adding these lines for me to easier see what the hierarchy is between my tab indents. 
Both of these are totally optional, and I'm using them just for the sake of visual clarity. So let's actually create a real snake file and do stuff with it. We're going to go back to our explorer. I'm going to close out some of these extra tabs. And I'm going to delete everything except for rule all and input. Also, right now, I'm not in the right folder, and I need to be. So I'm going to cd into my folder, which I call toots. I'm also going to clear the terminal. And for input, we're going to put in file1.txt and save it. This is indicating that the final target for our snakemake workflow is file1.txt. And since we're already in the conda environment, we have snakemake available. We can call it like this. We can also specify the snake file if we wanted to, but we already have a snake file with the right naming scheme, so we don't actually have to do that. So if I just say snakemake, it's going to go through the snake file and immediately give us an error. And this is actually what we want to see. What it's saying is that there's a missing input file for rule all. So to dissect what's happening, we are specifying that the input for this rule is file1.txt, and Snakemake can neither find a rule that generates that file, nor can it already find that file in our working directory. So this is expected behavior. To circumvent this, we can add another rule that I'm going to call touch file. And I'm going to not give it any inputs because it doesn't really have any dependencies and just give it an output. And the output is going to be file1.txt. And the shell command that we're going to have it run is to create it. So touch file1.txt. I'm going to save it. And now we're going to run snakemake again. And this time it gives us a very different output. For starters, this was a successful job. And let's go through the information it provides. In the yellow, it gives us a summary of everything that's about to happen. One core is the default that it gets provided. Later on, we will be giving it a different amount of cores. It also tells us the number of jobs that each of our rules will have. And then it gives this generic output text logging each one of the jobs. And we can also see in the explorer over here that file one was in fact created. We can also ls and see that, yes, file one is correctly in our project directory. So let's now add variables and introduce this term. What we have done here is that we have hard-coded an output, and in the shell command we have once again hard-coded it. This becomes a little bit problematic because what if we change this to file 11, let's say? We would have to go in and change every occurrence of file 1 to be file 11. Instead, what we can do is change this back to file 1, we can use variables. The keywords inside of a rule can be used as variables with their name. And we do that using curly braces. So here we have output. And if you're using the extension, it should highlight it to specify that it is something special and not just text. And so now we have output here, which will assume this value of file1.txt. So we can change this at will and not have to change what our shell command is. I should note that these variables for output shell and any other keywords that you're using within a rule, they're only respective to that rule. So if I was to have some other rule, and let me just copy this over here. If I was to have some other rule, let's call it touch file two, and this was to be 100, that this output only makes sense in the context of rule touch file two. It has no relation to the output from rule touch file. You can consider this a local scope. So let's just get rid of that. And we're going to delete file1.txt because we don't need it. We're going to save this. And we're once again going to run snakemake. And it gives us the same output over here. And once again, file1 is created. And this better demonstrates again that this output assumes the value that we have given output our keyword. So let's use this to actually introduce the message keyword. And this may better illustrate what's going on. Message is these green text logs that appear when you run rules. And so we can say now generating file, and I'm once again using this variable. 
output. I'm going to save it, I'm going to delete file one. Actually, let's not delete it and see what happens. So I'm going to run snakemake again. I've saved the snake file, but I have not deleted file one. And snakemake indicates there's nothing to be done. Now this is awesome. It's actually exactly what we want. Snakemake is inherently lazy and does not want to do any more work than it has to. Since we've specified in rule all that our target is file1.txt, if it's already present in our working directory, Snakemake doesn't have to perform any of the rules to generate it. And this is good, because that means that in most cases, Snakemake will not overwrite existing files if it doesn't have to. This is also super useful if that you're running a very, very detailed and involved workflow that if something was to happen on step 11 of 37, that you can just restart the Snakemake and it won't have to go through steps 1 through 11 again. This becomes very useful and very convenient for these long jobs. So there's nothing to be done, but now let's delete file one and run the snake make again. And you can see that once again, file one is created, but this time our job one has a much more interesting and informative text. And it says now generating file, file one.txt. So where this output variable was, it has now assumed the value of file1.txt, and we can very easily see that it has done that. We can also add fine-grained control for these variables by naming components of keywords. For example, let's say that we had multiple outputs, and we wanted to give them specific names that we could reference later. So let's say this is file1, and we can make another one as file2. And it follows this very Pythonic variable assignment. Now what we can do is leave it just as it is and have it dump out the way that it has. So let me save this. I'm going to delete file one. I'm going to clear the terminal. And we're going to run snake make again. You can see that even though we have named these components of output, that by just referencing output in a general fashion, that it dumps the components of output right onto it. So this command touch is actually touch file1.txt, file2.txt. And that's what's running under the hood. However, if we wanted to, we can use the python.indexing to further specify stuff. So here I have now generating files output.file underscore one and output.file underscore two. And if we wanted to, we could do the same here, but we don't really need to. So I'm going to delete both of these files. I'm going to save this, clear my terminal, and run snake make one more time. And now you can see that I have using this dot indexing fashion that you see in Python, we're saying now generating files one and file two, because output.file one assumes the value of output.file one, and output.file two assumes the value of output.file two. And we can do the same thing for input as well. This becomes very useful in much bigger workflows, especially, for example, in the realm of bioinformatics, where you might have forward and reverse reads of something and you want to specify what input goes where. Uh, but for now, it's just good to understand that you can name these components of inputs and outputs and that you can reference them specifically later on.